Good morning, and welcome back to campus. As many of you know, this is our first on-campus event since this. We are so excited to be here, especially to have you here at this hour. Amazing. And on a Thursday, and I didn't realize it was the first day of public school. So thank you for braving the traffic as well. This is, is a special day for us because exactly 12 years ago today, John Van Furstenberg came to the law school, banged a gavel, and declared the Fashion Law Institute a, a officially open. So we are not only celebrating the end of the pandemic and the start of the school year and the start of Fashion Week tomorrow, we're celebrating our anniversary. And so many of you have been a huge part of that that I want to thank you all very, very much. So today, uh, we have a double header, a, a, a mini symposium. Uh, and, uh, and as you know, our theme is on fashion police, hence the handcuffs. And I have no idea what Google thinks of me right now, <laughs> having sourced these things. But I do know that I have a tremendous panel uh, ready, ready to kick this off. As many of you know, retail theft has risen a great deal. According to the US Chamber of Commerce, which, by the way, is not a US government institution. It took me a long time to realize that it is, it is in fact, a a, a, an association of businesses uh, and a lobbying organization representing business interests, but they also do some great statistical work. In the past five years, retail crime in the U.S. has risen over 50 percent, and uh, over 54 percent, approximately 54 percent, of small business owners reported a rise in shoplifting from 19, from excuse me, 19. Wow, I'm in the last century. Uh, it is early um, between 2020 and 2021. So it is an issue, and it is certainly an issue for retail and, and especially luxury retail. Um, so I, what I have the people I have with us um, are, are ready to speak to that from various different perspectives. I have first up uh, Matthew Bauer. Matthew is from the Madison Avenue Business Improvement District. I know I don't need to introduce Madison Avenue to you all, but I, I may need to introduce the concept of a bid or business improvement district, so I'll let Matt, perhaps Matt start with that. Next to Matt is Christopher Hornig. I, I know, by the way, Matt is not only a, the longtime president of the bid, but also holds a PhD in, in urban planning and public policy. Um, so, uh, so he knows, he absolutely knows a lot about this area and has represented as a bid, bid president not only Madison Avenue but also the Lower East Side. So he's got Manhattan covered. Um, at, next to Matt, uh, we have Chris Hornig, who is a vice president and, and uh, let me get this right, vice president and assistant general counsel of Saks Off Fifth, where we get the best bargains. Um, and and, and uh, uh, Chris works a lot with online currently, but previously worked in litigation with Saks Off Fifth and its parent company, Hudson's Bay. Um, and so, so also knows a great deal about this area, and we're thrilled to have Chris with us. And he's also been a guest speaker, as some of you know, in our cosmetics law class, cosmetics regulation class, rather. And then next to Chris, we have Estelle Strikers Santiago, who has been for three decades with the Manhattan DA's office, I'm currently working with their community partnerships unit. And so I'm, I'm really excited uh, because both Matt and Estelle are serving on a special committee uh, that has been convened by our district attorney uh, to address this issue of retail theft in particular. Um, so, so really glad to have both, uh, both Chris and Estelle with us as, as well. And I should say, uh, Chris went to school at the, at the University of Texas, but we won't hold it against him. <laughs> We're glad he's up here. I'm sorry to, to let you know that Ashley Valdez, our professor of fashion retail law, um, and uh, who has a day job as well, she's principal counsel at Warby Parker, is sadly stuck in traffic. And, was, and she's, she's a very persistent woman. Some of you know her. She's, always, she's a proud graduate of the Fordham Law School. She was my research assistant. Ashley never gives up. So the traffic must be truly vicious for her to sit for several hours in traffic and finally tell us she won't be able to make it. Um, but that being said, uh, let us welcome the rest of our panelists. And, and I'll turn the mic over to Matt. And, uh, the, the... Be careful what you say. Oh All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for, um, for inviting me here. Honored to be here. 
the, yeah, so thank you. Um, so uh, just the, what a business improvement district is, you're actually in one. You're in the Lincoln Square bid right now, uh, but there are 77 business improvement districts in New York City. They are public-private partnerships uh, under contract with uh, the New York City Department of Small Business Services to provide supplemental um, programming to our member businesses. Uh, and uh, Madison Avenue bid uh, runs from 57th to 86th Street here on the Upper East Side. Uh, and we do have a public safety team of, uh, of uh, licensed public safety officers. Uh, we have a terrific relationship with the, uh, with the 19th precinct and actually just last week we hosted a uh, um, safety breakfast with the crime prevention officer from the 19th precinct but uh, the first thing I really need to do is give a shout out to Estelle. Uh, uh, I have the great pleasure of working with her on, on the committee, uh, uh, Small Business Alliance, and her team has truly been uh, terrific uh, to work with, and uh, Estelle personally has been great to work with, and really appreciate all the help that she's given, uh, not only to me, but to all the businesses that are in our district. So um, regarding... You know, first thing I should say, you know, it is not a victimless crime, which is what some people can think about, you know, well, stores just have insurance. You know, I, I hear countless times from store employees, uh, you know, when, that they feel violated, shooken up, afraid uh, when an incident happens uh, in their stores, and they've often commented to me about the, you know, sort of the brazen nature of what is, is happening. Um, uh, and, you know, according to the Buy Safe America Coalition, which actually includes many uh, major retailers, uh, they did a survey of, of uh, the incidents of organized retail crime, which I'll discuss in a second, and, you know, they said that 86% of retailers surveyed said that, uh, that uh, someone who was involved in organized retail crime has verbally threatened an associate. 76% said uh, an individual has physically assaulted an associate. This is, of course, nationwide, not just here. And 41 said that a, uh, a subject has used a weapon uh, in the commission of an organized retail crime. Uh, and I should tell you also the expense that retailers have to place to uh, you know, prevent uh, these incidents from happening is, is quite significant, you know, from paying for public safety officers in their stores, overnight guards, uh, which we've been seeing um, uh, paid detail officers from the police department, uh, hardening their windows and all the like. So, uh, and I should tell you, you know, we, as I mentioned in the very beginning, we've had terrific support from the 19th Precinct. They could not have been better. We have two officers that are dedicated just to Madison Avenue. They know the North store manager's names. Every store manager has their telephone number, their, you know, their cell phone number, their email address, and they call them. But at the same time, you know, grand larcenies in our precinct are up 61% this year alone, and uh, they are up 36% from what they were uh, 12 years ago. So uh, those are just, you know, constant numbers. Uh, so, you know, it is obviously a significant issue. And, you know, what's different now? I mean, there's always been shoplifting. Always, always, always been shoplifting. This is nothing new. Uh, but, you know, just as there are more venues to legitimately purchase goods, there are also more and more venues to illegitimately purchase, and sometimes the two are sort of blurred. Um, and, you know, according to that National Retail Federation, which you just quoted, um, uh, you know, that uh, organized retail crime, which is what we're, I think we were focusing on, is the large-scale theft of retail merchandise with the intent to resell the items for financial gain. It involves a criminal enterprise, a group of individuals who steal large quantities from a number of stores and a fencing operation to get rid of it. And I can tell you our store, stores have frequently seen folks, um, uh, you know, looking over the, the stores, doing surveillance in businesses all over, uh, and uh, they seem to know exactly what they are looking for uh, because they are, they're shopping. They're just shopping to take it and steal uh, and sell it. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're always concerned at the new season that uh, these incidents are going to um, 
uh, would happen again. Uh, but like I said, we have terrific efforts by the police department to truly try, and, and the DA's office especially, and you're going to hear a lot more about what their efforts have been, which have been tremendous, to uh, stem this uh, tide. And it's not only the large groups that you see that you know make the press. Sometimes an individual or two individuals come into a store, and the issue now is that there's new places by which to fence uh, these stolen goods. So you know, whenever an arrest is made, uh, and you know our, our, our DA is very very. Uh, DA Bragg has very pointedly said, you know, we have to follow the money, and it's true. Uh, we have to see where these items are are sold. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, what's to be done? You know, that U.S. Chamber of Commerce, which is not the United States Department of Commerce, you're right. Uh, you know, it's just said, you know, they, they're they're focusing on efforts at the federal level. Uh, there is actually new legislation that's being discussed. We're not so new anymore, called the Inform Act, the Integrity Notification and Fair to List in Online Retail Marketplaces Act, which is HR 5502, if you want to look it up. But that's a, you know, the, the, the um, uh, efforts to uh, provide legit, to sort of track what's being sold on online marketplaces and where the, that merchandise come from. Where does that stock uh, come from? And, you know, there are also efforts at the state level, which I'm sure we'll be hearing more about uh, very uh, shortly. Um, and, you know, there has been some really great success. Um, uh, just a couple of uh, weeks ago, or to, actually a couple, yeah, a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago, uh, the, you know, the, uh, there was a, a great uh, bust of that New Liberty uh, pawn shop uh, ring. Uh, 41 individuals were charged, an entire network, and they were selling their items on eBay. Uh, so that's uh, an important, uh, an important, uh, uh, significant case that has been been cracked, and uh, uh, and you know at the federal level, the federal government has been involved, and there's a very, uh, uh, very highly publicized case of an individual named Eric Spencer, uh, uh, who uh, you know who stole from a number of of of, of sort of particularly Chanel, uh, and um, you know threatened and and was bringing these items to sell at another state, and so the federal government was able to uh, arrest him under the Hobbs Act uh, for robbery. And so uh, that, that's a very significant, uh, significant effort. So, um, you know, we really are hoping that these cases, as well as the wonderful efforts of the DA and of, of the NYPD, will really make a, a stem this tide of what's happening. But uh, once again, we really do. This is this is an issue that is being addressed here in in the city and in Manhattan. And so we we just definitely want to continue to be great partners to uh, our, our our local agencies, including the DA. Thank you, Matt. Matt, that was fantastic. Thank you. Uh, let me ask you, uh, you, you've given us such great information. I have so many questions for you. But just to begin, you started out by saying that, that uh, shoplifting or retail theft, not a victimless crime. But how do you convince the public in general of that? Right? I mean, in, when we watch Breakfast at Tiffany, uh, shoplifting is adorable and flirtatious, right? Um, and or, or it could be noble when you have Jean Valjean is stealing bread for a sick child or, uh, or Robin Hood robbing from the rich and giving to the poor, which is maybe a little closer to robbing from Madison Avenue, right? Um, how do we deal with one kind of cultural perception of, oh, it's not a big deal, and oh, by the way, and this is what I've heard several times, insurance pays for that anyway. Well, I think this, go into any retail store, any store, and look who's sitting behind the counter. Who's standing at the counter? Who are the people who are directly encountering and dealing with these individuals? They're just ordinary New Yorkers. And every time uh, that something like this happens, people are scared. You know, the reason people, they are, and, and it, it is meant to be fair. So it's one thing to take a loaf of bread to steal also for yourself, but this is obviously, these are all goods that are being sold uh, and fenced in a much larger marketplace, which, um, which of course affects prices and affects all things. But, but I think the number one way of looking at it is there are people who are took the F train with me this morning, who are working at stores on Madison Avenue and every other store uh, around New York City. And, you know, uh, those are the folks that are at the front line. Uh, 
And you know, when you work in retail, this should not be a dangerous profession. This should be a safe place to work. And frankly, kids work. Lots of kids work in retail, uh, and you know, frankly, that's. It's, it's one of those also entry-level jobs for many people, and you just don't want for, for young people coming into the workforce, and you just don't want that experience to be the, it's something that they are having to deal with and potentially have ramifications with for the rest of their lives. Thank you so much. That's really important. Um, and just a quick follow-up on that. You all have security whom you hire as part of the bid, right, part of, of, the, of, the, of the expenses that you go to. How do you train your security who are probably unarmed uh, to deal with retail theft? That's, that's true. They are, they are unarmed, and, and we do have a team. Uh, first, I should say that all security guards, um, we call them public safety officers, but officially the title in, in New York State is security guard. They are licensed. And part of that licensing procedure through the New York State Department of State is they do have to go in through training. After someone is hired at our organization, we then go through an additional 40 hours of training uh, in our office. Uh, and, you know, we you know, provide them with lots of information. We give them, um, they all have radios, so they are constantly in communication with a base that we, we maintain. Um, but, you know, they are acting as eyes and ears. You know, they are not supposed to physically interdict. Um, uh, they, uh, but they really are when, you know, being a physical presence on the street, just being out there in a uniform, knowing there's somebody that's looking, somebody with a radio, that itself is a deterrent, uh, that's a deterrent of crime. And then we are, we are quickly to call, if it, there is an issue, we'll call NYPD. And, you know, also one of the things we do is the store is getting a big delivery. They, we're encouraging retailers to call us. And we'll stand by the, one of our offices will stand by the door while, you know, the goods are coming in and, and out. So, or hopefully coming in, right. Uh, so, right, so, uh, uh, they, they, uh, so that, that's a big part of what their, what their duties are uh, as well. And I should tell you, we have a very long tenured uh, staff. Uh, the average person has been with us for over 10 years. That, that is a long period of time in any job, uh, but great, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Chris, let's hear from the perspective of a retailer and Ren Retail. Uh, sure, thank you. Um, as Susan said, I'm in-house counsel for Saxo Fifth. I'm specifically now working on, with the e-commerce business, um, but I previously worked with the stores businesses on a wide variety of uh, litigation matters. Um, I should say briefly, I'm, these are my own views. I'm not giving official views of Office or any of its affiliates. Um, yeah, I mean, no question that um, retail theft and particularly organized retail theft is a major issue for all retailers. Um, I think as to the insurance point, insurance often isn't going to apply to every single item. You know, these are serious margin issues for the businesses uh, and it, it does make a big difference and there is a lot of money spent on general prevention of, of all kinds. Um, I think f from the perspective of an in-house attorney, it's sometimes a little different because you also see issues that arise uh, when you do have an intervention. Um, you know, I mean, in most, well, I think in every state, there's a shopkeeper's privilege. You are able to stop people from shoplifting. Um, that then leads to a lot of issues. You know, you have false arrest claims, false imprisonment claims, uh, you have discrimination claims. So um, my perspective is sometimes, well, what do we want to do to balance these issues? Um, and, you know, particularly with the rise in, a, what, you know, what you were talking about here of organized retail theft, a lot of which is organized online. There's a lot of communication out there and there's often ideas that you hear floated of, well, maybe we should be out there finding out what's happening. Um, I think that it then gets you into a lot of issues that we are clashing with privacy laws, which are increasingly stringent and um, affecting everything. So I think it's um, a little more complicated sometimes and legally sometimes fairly interesting to see these issues come up, uh, which you might think, well, we're the victim here. Why, why are we having to defend it in court? But I mean, you see people who literally will sue for their arm being injured because they were held by a police officer that your, your security guard called. And they'll sue the store for the injury caused by the police officer. Um, that kind of thing happens very frequently. So 
a lot of work to be done in terms of your you know policies training um, beyond just the sort of training of how do you try to prevent crime but also what do you do in those cases how do you present the best you know face to the world to your customers not deterring legitimate customers uh, while being fair to people who may be engaged in crime while still trying to stop them uh, it's, it can, it's certainly tricky that, that is a, a very complicated, actually, uh, the, the kinds of balances that you have to create. Um, and how, you mentioned the issue of, of trying to figure out sort of who the, who the issue is. To what extent are you all, uh, or not necessarily you all, but your retail colleagues, uh, using things like facial recognition technologies um, and algorithms to identify who the problems might be? Sure. Uh, it's a great question. Um, I think there's a lot of interest in the wider retail market in those technologies, but also a lot of legal concern around them. Um, you know, I, there's widespread dislike of the idea, I think, amongst the public of using facial recognition technology on customers or some kind of algorithm that's going to screen people. So even simply from like a public policy perspective, it's, it's, a, it's a big uh, minefield. Uh, just from a purely legal perspective, I think there are already states like Illinois that has a biometric uh, security law that would arguably um, prevent the use of um, facial recognition software. Uh, and I suspect that that's going to spread to other places. Uh, so I think that there would be you know, some serious concerns about introducing that kind of technology, even given existing laws, let alone with the probable expansion of privacy laws around the country that, that we're going to be seeing. So certainly interest, but also a lot of legal concern. One of the other sort of hidden legal concerns that you raised uh, is the concern about discrimination. If you do start targeting individuals whom you might think are suspicious, and, you, and particularly if you do so inaccurately. And we've seen um, everyone from Macy's to the late lamented Barney's uh, cited for um, stopping people for, for no other crime than shopping while black, right, in, in particular. Um, but how do you address that issue, right? You, you certainly want to, your employees to notice if someone is engaging in suspicious behavior, but you don't want people um, labeled as suspicious just for existing in their own skin. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's central, uh, and particularly as a in-house uh, lawyer working with um, you know, the security teams, it's really crucial to make sure that the training materials, um, the policies, and everything else all reflect that. Um, because, yeah, absolutely, you know, f fairly or not, people are going to make that accusation. And you really need to be prepared um, to show that, no, your policy is based on people's actions, uh, not based on appearances. Um, there needs to be a real focus on that, not just the policy. It, it has to actually, that actually has to be the case as well. You need to have the trainings. You need to reinforce it. Uh, you have to work on that all the time. Because, yeah, absolutely, there have been historically a lot of uh, case allegations of that. Um, and it's it does it comes up all the time. So I think I think that has to be addressed through through training uh, and a heavy focus on that issue when you're working with uh, the teams responsible for interacting with the customers. And as counsel, you must feel like you're constantly training because we're not all lucky enough to have our, our employees stay for ten years like like Matt's security team. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, there's always turnover. These kinds of things have to be done and reinforced all the time, and they have to be, you have to actually be out there making sure that it's happening in practice. That is great. And I want to come back to one other issue before moving on to Estelle, and that is Matt noted how terrifying it can be uh, to be the salesperson um, or the customer, I imagine, uh, and, and, to be, uh, and to be the victim of the crime uh, or to be, even though it's not your property, it is your workspace and your feeling of security and safety and personal space. How do you address that with your employees? Um, I, th I think it's a really difficult issue, um, and I mean, we haven't even touched on some of the kind of worst scenarios that can happen. I mean, we do active shooter training and things like that for our store employees. Um, I think that, in, I, I don't want to speak about our specific rules, but you, you want to have people who are not trained for it avoid a confrontation. So there's certainly an element of that, um, and uh, having your people who are expecting to be in that role, be the ones who have that interaction when possible, but you can't always control those things.
The people or the property <laughs> at the end of the day? Yeah, obviously the people are more important. In every Thank you so much. And now we'll move on to Estelle Stryker Santiago, um, who, as we mentioned, is the director of the partnerships, unit, the community partnerships unit, rather, at the Manhattan DA's office, and has been so for three decades. And so has seen lots of DAs come and go, but there's always Estelle. And I love that you two, you and Matt, are working so closely together on this committee. Thank you, um, and thank you for having um, having me here. I'm actually here on behalf of District Attorney Alvin Bragg Jr. Um, and so I and and I've been asked to talk a little bit about our Small Business Alliance, which uh, developed a retail theft plan, closely working with with Matt and other bids. Um, but before I go into that, I just kind of wanted to give an overview of what the team that I work with does, um, and a little bit about the DA's priorities which led to this this plan because it's one of his priorities so um, the community partnerships unit is a team of people we're not prosecutors we're not lawyers uh, but we're the community facing arm for the district attorney um, and in 2014 we became we created a mission um, and we've held that mission and we're holding it under DA Bragg in fact he's asking us to do more of what we've been doing um, but our mission is to, to foster trust between the community and our office and law enforcement in general uh, to raise awareness about different public safety issues that are impacting the community as well as awareness about what the DA is doing what his vision is and initiatives like this that we're working on uh, to ensure access for all communities in Manhattan um, as I'm sure you all know we, we, we live in a very diverse borough and we have people coming into the borough to work um, and we try to make sure that we break down barriers whether it's language barriers ensuring that the staff in our office have translators available so people feel comfortable coming forward um, or cultural barriers so that the prosecutors in the office we have 1500 people in our office by the the way um, so that the prosecutors and the other professional staff are aware of different cultural barriers that may exist and why somebody may not be comfortable talking about what happened or coming forward on what happened um, so it's trust it's awareness it's access and the fourth component of our mission is creating partnerships that prevent crime um, and the partnership that we created through the small business alliances is, is an example um, we have two teams we have a community engagement team and an education team in the community partnerships unit they work kind of overlapping um, our education team works with prosecutors to create presentations on things like internet safety domestic violence gun violence prevention um, also one that we've been doing very often is the arrest to disposition process so we go into the community and we talk about what happens after an arrest and what our role is in the process uh, so that's the awareness raising component that our education team works on and then our community engagement team is assigned we have staff assigned geographically to all the areas of Manhattan so we have somebody who covers Washington Heights and Inwood Lower East Side East Harlem Midtown uh, and their job is to know the issues uh, impacting that community bring back concerns of the community to the office as well as bring the information of the office to that community uh, and so when DA Bragg took office as you may know he took office in January of this year so he's been there for nine months uh, he had some key priorities that he came in with and then when he got there and learned about what was going on in the community he added some priorities his priorities have been gun violence prevention as you know in addition to the uptick in shoplifting there's been an increase in gun violence uh, hate crimes uh, also how we work with victims and ensuring that victims are aware of the resources and support that we have as they go through the criminal justice process uh, and the one that he sort of took on as we as we got to know what was going on in the communities on his behalf is the shoplifting issue by being out in the community and engaging with the community we got the feedback we heard from small business owners who I've been in meetings where small business owners were crying about what happened and what they witnessed and having a customer come in and have somebody come in and stick their hand in their pocket and take uh, you know their wallet out and leave um, so so we we saw directly and I believe it's really important for us to be out there and we have a district attorney who himself wants to be out there and join us but he can't be everywhere right so we're out there doing that on his behalf 
Um, it looks like Ashley might be here. Welcome, Ashley. That's great. Um, and so, so that that that's what our our team does. And in doing that. Um, Again, we learned about this issue of not only from the community, but from our own data in the office that there's been this significant increase in, in uh, small business theft as well as bigger retail theft. And so the way that we look to address that is the DA formed a small business alliance. I say small business, that's how it started, but as we gathered information, we brought in larger, um, you know, any business that was being impacted by uh, by uh, retail theft. And we broke it into different areas. So we have a chairperson um, for each area. We have a chairperson who's representing the retail theft issues up in Inwood and Washington Heights. We have a chairperson who's representing Midtown and the Upper West Side and Upper East Side and so on. Um, and very much so our bids were involved. And so we had a number of Zooms. Um, it's so nice to be here in person, I have to say. But all of these meetings that we, well, not all of them, some of the smaller groups that we met with we did in person, but our bigger meetings were, were via Zoom. Um, and we listened and we learned and we looked at our data. Um, and as a result of the business alliance that we created early on in, in the DA uh, taking office, um, we came up with sort of a five-pronged plan to address this, this increase in retail theft. Um, I have my, my cheat sheet in case I forget, but um, I'm pretty aware of them, so I think that I'll, I'll be able to cover all five of them. Um, I'm going to start with the one that was referenced already, which is this idea, um, not this idea, the fact that there's organized crime um, around retail theft. Um, and as was mentioned earlier by Matt, the DA really wants us to follow the money and, and, and focus on the organization and the entities that are uh, creating uh, structures that, that commit this crime. Um, so he assigned a very specific person who has a lot of experience in this area to take on those types of cases and look at long-term investigations um, and bigger cases, you know, sometimes with a small low-level shoplifting, there's not a whole lot we can do um, in terms of uh, the case, but the bigger cases we can do. So that's that's one, um, you know, sort of looking upstream who's organizing this and how we can take down those the bigger organizations. Um, a second part is to really, well, we looked at the data, and there's a small percentage of people who are committing the most uh, uh, retail theft, the recidivists. And so we're really looking at that small percentage of people who may or may not be connected to the organization, but who, who keep uh, going back and committing this, these, these thefts um, and are sort of taking advantage of the opportunity to do that. We really want to focus on them. And so we know when they, that when they get arrested and we can bring together a stronger case um, for them. Um, a third component, which lines up very much with, with the DA's vision, which is that that uh, for those people who are committing low-level crimes because they have other issues, whether they're unhoused or they have addiction um, issues, mental health issues, there's a lot of mental health issues that are overlapping right now with criminal activity and we have to be smart about how we deal with that. But for those who are committing really low-level crimes, we don't think that the answer to that is um, arresting you know, our, our way out of that problem. We think that we need to work together with uh, agencies that serve people with those issues. And so he, the DA they created a brand new division uh, called Pathways to Public Safety. And the whole purpose of that division is to find ways to divert people uh, to get help. And so we've been doing a lot of visiting different social service agencies, meetings with other agencies to, to, to work on that overlap and to make sure that we're not creating a bigger problem by sending people to, to Rikers or to prison um, and having them come back out worse than they were before. Um, so that's the third prong is, is really enhancing programmatic options um, to address the issue. Uh, the, a, a fourth prong is our coordination with the NYPD. Uh, so we meet part of the alliance was also NYPD uh, is on the alliance as well and works and is at all of our meetings. Um, and we sort of come at it a, at two levels, a high level where we had high level members of NYPD at the alliance and, and working with us. And then my team um, more sort of in the weeds when there's an arrest in the 19th precinct or in the first precinct, the commanding officer can reach out to us and talk to a, 
us about how this fits into the bigger problem of retail theft. Um, so we're communicating um, very closely with NYPD on the issue. Uh, and then the fifth prong of, of the five prong plan um, is uh, the work that my team does directly, which is transparency, talking to people like Matt or small business owners or target, you know, big business owners about what happens after an arrest is made. There's a lot of um, sort of misconceptions, misunderstandings about what happens after arrests. And so people can call us to find out what happened on that case where we know the precinct came, they made an arrest, we want to know what happened. And if there is some trauma related to the arrest, we talked about the impact that this has on the staff and all the different retails. Um, you know, make sure that that person is is getting the services and the support that they need and understand the process if if they do need to come down or or talk to us about the case and that we're getting supporting documents um, because we do sometimes need people to sign off to say yes this actually did happen and if we don't get that um, we can't do our job and so there's that kind of enhanced communication with our with our community partners and in this case those community partners are businesses um, so that, that's that's our plan. Um, that's one of many initiatives that we're doing, and it's it, it's one that we're very focused on right now. And we appreciate the partnerships that we have with the bids and with Matt and others. Um, and our goal is really to to reduce this this issue. Estelle, I'm thrilled that you're here, and particularly because I especially was happy that I was guessing you would address both sides of the human equation. That is to say, both people on the on the on opposite sides of say it as a transaction, but the involuntary transfer of property, shall we say. Um, but uh, how, how do you resolve tensions between the individuals who are coming to you, uh, from the retailers and so forth, saying you've got to stop this, I can't run a business like this, um, community members who are, are worried about losing um, maybe not the luxury stores in their neighborhoods, which might have longer leases, but maybe some of the smaller mom and pops who, don't, who are afraid to reopen or are just trying to reopen post-pandemic and, and, and are struggling through that, and the individuals on the other side who are committing thefts. Um, maybe not the you know, hardcore um, retail theft rings, right, who are a little less sympathetic, but those in individuals who have other kinds of pressures, financial pressures, mental health pressures, and so forth. How do you address the, the uh, how do you create empathy? And how do you, to from that empathy, create solutions? Yeah, it's a great question, and it's probably the bulk of, of what what I do uh, with with our team, which is I think it's building relationships and and really talking to people and hearing from them what they're going through. Um, I mentioned earlier that you know the mental health issue and and the number of people who are unhoused right now. I think it's impacting all of us. You know, you walk down the street, and while you want to be understanding that people have mental health issues and you want them to get help, you're also afraid, and you don't want to be assaulted, and you don't want your children to be assaulted, and you don't want your and store owners don't want um, to to have situations in their store. So a lot of it is listening and hearing what is really going on and making sure that the that my office knows what's going on um, and then I think it's it's raising awareness it's it's going out and explaining because I think some of the frustration that people feel is that people get arrested and then they see them the next day back in the same area where it happened um, and so there's reasons for that and some are legal reasons why you know if it's a very low level case they may have received a desk appearance ticket and 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 therefore gotten back out or um, it just the process may have that it may be a low-level case where um, they're not going to be held in um, and and I think people think we're doing it intentionally like why are you not doing more is the question that we we get and so I try to start with the base here's what we can do here's what the law allows us to do bringing prosecutors out and giving that arrest to disposition overview um, but also having conversations about what do we all want. Do we want to arrest away the problem or do we want to figure out ways to help the people that have mental health issues and um, get them the help that they need because that's a longer term solution for everybody. Um, but it's a challenge, I will say. It's a, it's, it's a challenge. I, I was up on 125th Street um, uh, the other day at, at th that particular group has created a coalition of agencies working together to try to address the homelessness and the impact. Um, 
And I was also at Harlem Hospital listening to doctors talk about what they're dealing with with mental health issues and also the same question. And But they were saying, we don't want you to necessarily put them in prison, but we want it to stop. So, so what does that look like? And to me, it looks like working with other agencies that, that can help those who are um, impacted by these issues. I hope that answers your question. So helpful, because as we all know, yes, we're in a law school, but law can be a fairly blunt instrument, right? And there's only so much we can do with law. We have to look beyond it. Uh, let me ask you one other, one other question before I move on to Ashley, and that is there is a, another party involved in all of this, and that is the, uh, the reseller, right? Um, so, or, or the buyer of the potentially stolen property. So particularly when we're talking about organized retail theft of luxury goods. Um, no one needs 100 Birkins. Um, maybe Drake or Kris Jenner want 100 Birkins, uh, but, uh, but most of these things go on to be resold on various platforms online, eBay, uh, the real, real, they didn't want to talk to us, uh, but we love them anyway. Uh, but um, but, uh, but how do you deal, or how does the DA's office uh, deal with, it? Is, that, is that something you're proactively looking at, how to address the resale problem and, and thus uh, cut off the, um, those who might be interested in buying those things? So addressing it from the demand side and the resale side. Yeah, I, I'm not the expert on, on what's being done about that, but what I can, what I can guess from the person who the DA assigned to look at the, the bigger picture is that they are looking at that and they would probably also need to coordinate with other, uh, agencies that, that also look at that, at the regulations around that. Um, but I, I think that as his, the, the special assistant who's doing this is named Chris Conroy, and I think as Chris does deeper dives into the organization behind this, they are probably looking at it. It probably over, overlaps with, we have a huge, um, you know, computer forensic unit that, that works, so it's probably overlapping with them, and they're building cases on that, yeah. That, that is great to hear, and that's where Matt mentioned the Informed Consumers Act that is, is in the House right now um, it, 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 that, that may address something like that on the federal level, uh, particularly for large sale resellers. But uh, speaking of online, um, I have, didn't I tell you all that Ashley Valdez is a very determined woman? How many hours were you in traffic to get here, Professor Valdez? Three. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, and, and you taught until how late last night? Eight. So we're just going to set up a cot at the law school and keep Ashley here uh, because we're so thrilled that you're here. Um, so as I mentioned, um, Ashley Valdez, a graduate of the Fordham Law School and a professor of, of fashion retail for us uh, and principal counsel at Warby Parker. So please, Ashley, welcome and thank you for your persistence in being here. Um, yeah. Okay, there you go. Um, so yeah, so um, I work at Warby Parker. Um, I am primarily responsible for a lot of um, our intellectual property brand and advertising work, but that doesn't mean that I'm a stranger to the, the, the theft side of things or the loss prevention side of the house. Um, Warby Parker is no stranger uh, to, to loss of inventory or shrinkage or anything of that sort. Um, like we said, we started online, which meant that as part of one of our original launches, we actually have what we call a home try-on program. Super attractive to people because you get five frames for free delivered to your home. And you only get charged for those frames if you don't return them within the five days um, that, that, the, that uh, we've allotted from a shipping perspective. Um, as part of the program, sure, we take your account information, we take your card information, but it doesn't actually get charged for anything. Um, and so some of our more notable um, instances of theft or fraud that have been committed against Warby Parker have been using our home try-on program. One of them in particular got a whole lot of press because um, someone managed to take about $130,000 worth of frames um, before they were, they were ultimately stopped. Um, so this happened in Georgia, and essentially what this uh, person did was created a whole bunch of false customer accounts, used a lot of prepaid debit cards, gift cards, things like that, that will run a test transaction, which is all our system requires, is just to validate that it is an existing or valid non-expired card, um, and then they just never return the boxes. So I think it was I th almost 300 orders or so of five <laughs> frames um, that ultimately occurred. 
Um, so we did end up partnering in that um, instance with law enforcement uh, to track the person down. Uh, they, it ended up being flagged to us, ironically. Um, and in this case, I think we internally have always said that like our customers are our best, um, are our best police officers. Um, it was actually a customer who flagged it and noticed that someone was selling a bunch of frames on Poshmark. And it was a suspicious and an unusually high amount of frames that this one individual had for sale. And they were like, we just wanted to point this out in case you weren't aware. Um, and we're talking about some of these retailers that don't necessarily, or resale platforms that don't necessarily have checks and balances in place to determine whether or not those goods were acquired lawfully um, or rightfully. So how do you balance that idea of like there's a, there's a, a bona fide secondary sale or we're talking about goods that were actually stolen and have actually never been in the hands of a bona fide customer. Instead, they were, they're just stolen and put on the marketplace. Um, so once our customer flagged that for us, um, we started to work with law enforcement. We did not recoup the actual glasses. Um, and the person did end up um, pleading guilty and ultimately did do some prison time. So there is, there's definitely, I think, some some room there to work with law enforcement. I think what we've ultimately done, um, the home try on program is still a huge part of our business and still something that we consider super important. We have a very large brick and mortar retail presence, but it's not everywhere. Um, so we still have a lot of customers who shop online with us and we wanna make sure that they still have the option and the ability to try on glasses or anything like that um, in a physical form if they can't or don't have access to a physical store where they can touch and feel the glasses, try them on, see how they fit on their face. Um, so it's definitely something where instead we just look internally and we've instead looked at all of our, we've worked with our loss prevention team, we have an entire team and we look at the strategies that we can put in place. Um, I think when we were maybe a younger company and smaller, everything was just reactive and it was about preserving inventory, stopping the shrinkage, how do you like curtail the theft? I think we take a broader, more mature view on it now. I think it's overall asset protection, like how do we protect all of our assets? So not just the actual inventory that is lost, but our customers and even our employees. Um, so not all of this theft happens online, not, not all of it is through our home try-on program. We do also, just like every other retailer, have actual physical stores that are sometimes stolen from. Um, so we've just essentially adapted our strategies. We've identified the goals that we want in place and the goals that we've decided to put in place is that we're protecting all of our assets. That's our customers, our employees, and the inventory that we have in place. Um, our inventory obviously is replaceable. <laughs> Sometimes the people that are in there are not. So we, we want to make sure that everyone feels comfortable um, coming to work, shopping in our stores, despite what the trends might indicate. Um, We've obviously adapted our models and our forecasts to account for increased shrinkage and loss. Um, and then what we've done is we've essentially trained, increased or re-upped training. Um, so we train all of our staff, all of our employees, both on the corporate and the retail side to flag and identify issues or suspicious patterns, anomalous um, uh, buying activities. And then we've also implemented a whole lot of role playing, especially for our retail teams, for example. So it seems goofy and uncomfortable at the moment to role play that you're, you know, <laughs> oh, there's a theft in the store. We want you to feel uncomfortable in the moment so that the, the at the point in time when it actually occurs, you're comfortable and prepared to handle the situation. Um, so we do role play, we've increased training, and I think in those cases, it's just some of the ways that we've um, tried to handle it. Um, I, like, yeah. <laughs> Really great examples and specifics. Thank you so much, Ashley. You said something that was particularly interesting to me, and that is you've said you've incorporated increased shrinkage and loss, including theft, into your projections and so forth. Now, you and, of course, HBC, both public, right? Um, how much is this an issue when you're having to report and, and to answer to shareholders and so forth? Um, so, Chris and Ashley. Um, well, HPC actually went private a few years ago, um, so I, I can't give much detail on the actual margins or anything like that. Um, obviously, you have to factor it in. You have to try to get your best estimate of it, and yeah, it is on the increase. So those things do have a, a real-world impact. So we're affecting value in at the large scale as well as value at the small scale. Yeah, 
Um, no, I, I think you know we we definitely have disclosure requirements. Obviously, that we are we are now contending with um, a lot of those uh, like numbers and, and sheets and those projections are, are things that we you know put out in our quarterly earnings reports and things like that. So we we do try to be as transparent as possible. Obviously, where we're legally required to do so, and also just to instill trust um, in our customers. And if part of that means just planning um, for some of that loss, um, that, that's just what we've sort of incorporated into the model. And proactively now, coming back to the individual who stole almost $130,000 worth of, of eyeglass frames from you, um, and, uh, how now do you start flagging that? And how do you prevent someone else from, uh, from uh, creating a copycat crime? Yeah, um, so in the in the recent years, we've, we've definitely started to look at tools and, and test tools um, that help not only, you know, essentially they'll just scour the system in the database um, and basically our point of sale system um, for patterns, for, for interesting, unique, anomalous buying patterns. So why has this person placed 258 home try-on orders of five frames each? Like she can't seem to decide. <laughs> like, we have a lot of glasses but not that many <laughs> like eventually you can make a, a decision it's not about um, it's not like a, a decision fatigue issue uh, so you know patterns like that should be flagged um, and so we, we we there are tools out there on the market and tools that that we we are definitely actively exploring um, but like we said we are also still training internal teams our customer experience teams interact with customers on a daily basis and also are sometimes our front line of defense in like flagging like hey I've I've talked to this person like seven times in the last like three months and it's always about like the home try on order is lost. I don't know where it went. I can't return it. Uh, so you know, there, there's, I think there's definitely a lot of tools and, that we can put in place but we are definitely using some of the internal like manpower that we have in house and just retraining and making sure that everyone is aware of what some of these things might look like, how to handle them sensitively. Obviously, um, we, we have obviously seen a huge uptick in I think like verbally abusive customers um, in, in in a lot of cases, so we definitely want to make sure that everyone still feels safe while doing their job. Um, and so we've also just incorporated into that training, like how do you handle it if you think that there's a problem? When, when do you escalate it? Um, and how, how, how do you discuss it? Wow, it, it sounds like the human element is just so powerful. I'm hearing this theme all the way through in this kind of prevention, whether it's uh, Matt having a security, uh, having security teams um, at, at stand uh, on, on the street and just be present um, to this kind of detailed training and even the, the input from customers all the way through. So we, that's very important. I want to open up the floor to questions, of which I'm sure that you all have many. Uh, don't be shy, um, but what would you all like to know about these issues and how they're being addressed and strategies for moving forward. Michael. Um, I have a kind of a related question. Uh, but you mentioned insurance margins, and I'm wondering if you could talk about that a little more, if insurers are willing to cover the cost of the retail price um, when you make those claims, or if or how they're essentially determining the value of what they're going to give you back. Sure. Um, you know, I have some exposure to our uh, insurance side of things. I don't handle it uh, directly myself. Um, my impression is that there's a, a lot of variety in the you know insurance that you can get out there. It also has become much more expensive and generally worse. So I think one issue is simply, depending on what kind of store we're talking about, it, the individual item that's been stolen may just be under the deductible. There may not be any coverage for it whatsoever. Um, so it may only be when you have something like a really large scale situation or particularly high value items at you know a luxury store where you're even going to have coverage to begin with. Um, and yeah, then then it's going to be a, a question. I, I think usually they're going to give you the replacement value for the item for wholesale if you're in that that sphere. But again, you have to get there. And you've already paid a lot of money just to have the coverage that maybe didn't even kick in to begin with. Um, so it's definitely not a cure-all at all. Um, and yeah, there may well be a dispute about what the actual you know value is that you're going to get back. So I wouldn't say that any of that is easy. 
that, that's actually a really good point, right? The wholesale value is, it, it, make, it replaces what you've, of course, spent, but it doesn't make your margins, right? It, it doesn't, and, and it's not as though, um, given the seasonal nature of fashion, um, that most of the time you can just order another one and put it back in the store. It's done, it's over. Um, so that's a really great point and a great question. Thank you. I think I saw another hand. Uh, Mary Kay. Thanks, Jordan. Um, when do you decide to publicize like a good result? Because I think maybe there's the question of, okay, well, we've done all this hard work. It's great. We want to show off, especially the coordination between in-house and the DA's office, for example, but then maybe you don't want copycats or to tarnish the brand. Like how to, I guess at first I was only going to ask Chris and Ashley, but then it impacts all of our speakers. Like, do you guys coordinate those efforts from a PR standpoint? Yes, I'm sure Matt doesn't want to fly the flag and say, guess what, we have lots of theft, but we're stopping some of it. Yeah. <laughs> Great question. Um, yeah, I don't know that I have a, a answer on that one necessarily. I think probably our t loss prevention teams would prefer not to talk about it a lot of the time. Um, they like to like people to know that there are you know, forces that are trying to deter them, but probably not get into the details a lot. Obviously, if you have a situation where it's kind of become public and you know maybe it's been picked up on in the media, that that's very different, and then then you are going to talk about it. Um, but my first instinct is, yeah, you probably don't want to announce a whole lot about you know thefts that have happened. I would agree. I think our our original preference and our initial preference would be not to publicize it, and we we don't usually you know create a PR campaign around it. I think in this instance on this one um, theft, the AG was really excited to talk about what he was doing to curtail retail theft and used it as an example. And we 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 essentially just we tried to lean into it. We gave as much um, you know information as we were comfortable giving, but I I think our teams would probably internally prefer that it didn't actually happen and didn't actually get out there because um, we, we want everyone to feel safe and we are doing things internally um, um, to make sure that that we curb that impact so there's no we don't think that we need to sound the alarm <laughs> I would say um, from our perspective it's sort of two different things it's it's one case at a time getting back to the people that were impacted by the crime if it came to our office and we prosecuted it make sure that the store and, and the individuals involved know what happened with the case not every so many of our cases aren't going to make PR or press um, and then the challenge for sort of the bigger ones the the organized crime behind them is that the investigations take a long time um, but if there ever is a good result for a long-term investigation we would do you know a press release about it and it's important for the community to know that that, that it has happened um, so yeah I think it's sort of a balance between just the direct communication that we have with the people that we serve on this issue and then press releases um, yeah and, and I'd like to shout out about how great the 19 precinct has been. I mean, the fact that they're out there every day, and I think that that is something when you see that police presence on the street. They are. There is an effort by by city government and at the DA's office to make to make to make folks safe. And I think that's something that we should be we'd be proud of and appreciative of. And you know, just as though we on the retail side can say, well, we want more, but when we when we are getting that support, I think it's important that the public knows that that too, and we appreciate that. And it's an important part of the the budgeting process of the city and and of the um, you know the efforts of of us as a, as a community to you know to make us safe. I, I would also add, from law enforcement perspective, the community wants to see the stats go down, right? They want to see the number of, of shoplifting and grand larcenies going down. And so that's another thing that we would reflect if the stats start to go down as a result of the 19th precinct and other precincts presence and our, our prosecution, we would share those stats. Um, I will throw out there that sometimes folks are more interested in what's going up and what, what's negative versus we don't always get a whole lot of excitement other than from our partners who are working hard with us on it when something goes down. But we should be sharing that and we do share that when it happens. And that's our goal is, is to bring the number of um, grand larceny and petty larcenies down. I think we need to send our extra muffins to the 19th precinct afterwards. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> uh, yeah, there was a question down front. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought I was, I, there was an indication of a question. Yes. 
who was, ah, yes. Um, I know the INFORM Acts were mentioned before and about 13 states have passed their own versions pending federal legislation, but I'm wondering what the, I'm wondering what the retailers and city government's interest is in possibly collaborating with those third party marketplace to maybe curb the reselling or gaining the information of the sellers. And for anyone who doesn't know um, what the inform acts are requiring, they're asking third party marketplaces to um, ask sellers for contact information and a lot of like tax information to verify that they are um, authentic sellers. Um, and they have to disclose that to customers as well. So I'm just wondering about if there has been thoughts about um, collaborating with those marketplaces. That's a great question. And in terms of the bigger picture, also so this is also a proposal to address um, counterfeit issues and, and, this, and the selling of counterfeits. So not only stolen goods, uh, but, but counterfeits as well. So, I just there are there are the there are many individual retailers that have been supporting and active in, in that effort. And you can you know take a look um, you know, through the National Retail Federation and, and other groups that, that this is a, a number of major retailers that are very much in, engaged in, in it. I can't speak to any of them individually because we're not one of them, because uh, we're not a retailer. But uh, but there there also been efforts at the state level. And I think that there is a lot of community support. And maybe yeah, and, we're working and on the, the DA is working closely with elected officials as well, looking at it. And I'm sure other um, city agencies are as well. Um, we're we're going to do everything we can to, to curb the issue. And so if it involves legislation, we will also look at that and support it when we can. Matt's point about the NRF and the U.S. Chamber and others kind of goes back a bit to Mary Kate's question about publicizing results here. It's much easier to publicize results or even to speak about these issues publicly through an organization that you as a retailer belong to. Um, so rather than speaking on your own behalf so that your brand is associated in the news article with the issue, you speak through your, your proxies. Um, and so that's why Matt is, is here speaking, which is great. Other questions? Yes, in the back. Is there a difference between like stealing versus shoplifting? Like the whole point is stealing, even though it's a shoplifting. So how does it like? How does it differentiate? Like if the idea is stealing. I mean, I would say stealing is taking from from somebody else. Whether you steal from somebody's personal home or from from their body, and shoplifting is actually stealing from a, a retail agency. Yes, it is absolutely. Both are crimes. Yeah, and there's different, depending upon the amount that you take, um, how it's done, whether you have a weapon when you're doing it, there's all kinds of different levels from misdemeanor to, to felonies. And that impacts what we're able to do in terms of prosecution. It also impacts how much time the person um, could get in, in jail or prison. Estelle, since, since you brought up those levels, there's been some controversy in New York and in California and in other places about recent changes to the level at which a, a mis misdemeanor shoplifting or misdemeanor uh, theft becomes a felony. And those numbers have been raised recently, in part because goods get more expensive. And, and, and so it's, there's a natural response to inflation and that sort of thing. But there's also concern about putting low-level of offenders in, in jail. Um, so could you speak to that and the changes that you've seen over the decades with the DA's office and, and how you're responding to questions about changed levels? So there's a lot of layers to that question in terms of the decades. Um, so I, I think what you also might be referring to is the recent changes in legislation that yes. impact um, bail and discovery. Absolutely. Yeah, and so that that has impacted um, sort of what I was mentioning before in terms of who's bail. There are differences in who's bail eligible. Um, so when somebody gets arrested and then they go in front of a judge and the assistant district attorney um, is determining whether they can ask for bail, uh, the, the, the changes in the law changed which cases they could do that. 
then they changed it back a little bit, so they increased the number of cases that they can ask for bail. Um, another change was something called desk appearance ticket and who's eligible for that, and that's a desk appearance ticket is a very, it's a low level, it's either a violation or some misdemeanors, um, and they increased the requirement for the NYPD to issue DATs on cases, which means that a desk appearance ticket is an arrest, but instead of getting taken to the precinct and then brought downtown to be arraigned in front of a judge, you're you're handed um, like a, a it looks like a summons, but this is still an arrest that says come back in three weeks for your arraignment. So the person is let right back out, and so that's what kind of led to people seeing people get out more quickly. Um, that also has changed. They've they've increased um, the number of people that are or number of types of cases that are eligible for TA as a result of some of the feedback that the community gave. They've changed that legislation. Um, the bigger impact on us was really the discovery requirements. Um, we were, uh, there were a lot of increased requirements for how quickly and how much and what we have to turn over, the prosecutors have to turn over to, a de to defense attorneys and that just in, in, you know, increased kind of the workload and so we all of the five DAs had to kind of adjust to that and make sure that we had systems and staff and protocol in place to, to adhere to that. Um, in terms of the long-term changes over the years, I've worked for Robert Morgenthau, I worked for Cy Vance, and now I'm excited and proud to work for um, Alvin Bragg. Um, they all have been you know, amazing at their work, and, and what I'm excited about with this current district attorney is just his focus on being smart about how we handle, not to say Vance and Morgenthau were very smart as well, but he sort of, he took Vance's vision also, which was to, st to not use prison and incarceration as the only strategy for public safety and um, is is elevating that even even more so. I think we're progressing and realizing that we need to, to really look at how we work as a prosecutor's office um, and the whole criminal justice system. Yes. Uh, there's a, qu a question in the back? Yes. Yeah. Uh, that, actually, that, question is a perfect segue. Ah, that question is a perfect segue to the question I wanted to ask which has to do about incentives. We talked, there was a lot about um, the unhoused and the mental health issues and the drug issues affecting crime and reforming because we don't want to necessarily uh, uh, punish people for that and, and, and do something ineffective. But what about stopping crime that is, in a way, uh, an expression of a rational risk calculation? That is to say, okay, they go, the people in the shops aren't going to be carrying weapons. They're not going to be defending physically against the sort of theft. Uh, at a certain level, there are individuals who could be deployed in an organized fashion who are not necessarily going to face a substantial amount of prison time. They may not even have bail. Um, what can we do from a design perspective in stores to offset those elements of the risk calculus? where they say, you know, we're going to get this amount of return for this level of risk. You know, do, is fashion, are fashion boutiques destined to become like another CVS or Dwayne Reed, where everything's behind a plastic thing, we have to call the clerk to, to, to see it? You know, what, what can we do, and this is a question to everybody, what can we do from a design sense to offset those, um, that risk calculus, because I don't think that, that, it's, that that risk calculus is going to be changing anytime soon uh, in, in terms of the, the current factors. Great question. Open to answers from the audience as well, as some of you are in the industry. Um, well, I think that um, at the higher end, you do see that reflected in design. I think, you know, there are strategies and, and even architecture elements put in place where particularly high value items are going to be not on the main floor, not in easy access to the stairwells. Um, I think you mentioned off-duty police officers. I mean, it, it's not necessarily the case that they're not armed individuals around. Um, not necessarily the case that there aren't people who are specifically tasked with actually preventing theft. Um, so could there... I note again that Chris went to school in Texas. <laughs> sure. <laughs> not saying I want them to get involved. Um, so, I, you know, I think that those kinds of things may be at, at certain high ends of the market are already an element of the thinking. Uh, as you say, I don't know if you want that in every jewelry boutique um, to feel like you're walking into a, a bank uh, or a CVS. Um, but, but yeah, I, I think that is something that is considered. I think the issues of lighting are really important. That's something that um, 
you know, we, when we hear our crime prevention officers speak to our stores, I mean, they say regarding the design issues, you know, making sure that there's lighting that's adequate, mirrors that you could you could see around the store at all time, which is it's helpful too if you want to try something on, but just to, you know that you could see. One thing uh, you see a lot of stores blocking their windows with signage, and really important that you could actually see in, and that's important for um, when a store is closed at night, when a police officer could look inside to make sure that, you know, things are okay, uh, and at the same time that people who are inside the store could see out, and that there is this that it's a public, very open space, and that's really, you know, really important, you know, in terms of placement of goods and where they're placed in the store and not putting everything in the front, where it's just quickly to take out, but, you know, things, things are, that are, that you, you do, you do see. Um, but, you know, just making sure that, I think the number one issue is visibility. Making the store as open, airy, items as visible to everyone as possible, I think would create a safer situation for everyone. And I think that's one of the things that we, we, we consistently hear as a, recommend, as a recommendation. And I would say from our, our perspective, you're sort of describing the opportunistic group that, that, that we want to, you know, go, go all in to, to, for a number of reasons and prosecute them. I think one of them is if we can get a strong case against either the individuals or the group, um, we're sending a message that this is not okay. And then, you know, we see this also kind of with drug cases. Once the word gets out that we're actually addressing this in law enforcement as well, then it hopefully curtails it and they, they don't feel so brazen to be able to go. So the combination of all the preventative measures that, that are being discussed and then us, you know, taking the cases seriously and, and really looking at them closely and prosecuting them to the best of our ability, I think sends a message um, that, that this isn't okay. Because what we're hearing sometimes is that people think that those that are committing, feel like they're just going to, they're going to get away with it anyway. So, um, so we're, we're working on that as well to, to partner with the community around that. Related to that, something that a, a couple of boutique owners have shared with me, well, one boutique owner, the, another who uh, works for a very, very large um, electronics company that is probably well represented in the room today. Um, small details. You could redesign your whole store, right, um, and with, with great lighting and, and with special places toward the back for your val valuable items. Or you could also, at, until you can afford to do that and have time to do that, do things like not hang your either clothes on the hangers with, with the hanger, with the uh, loop of the hanger facing out, but put the, the open side of the hanger facing out. In other words, hang it from the back of the rack, harder to grab very quickly and run. Details, tiny details, or uh, something that deal, that uh, addresses the issue of items getting shop worn as well, having too much merch on display. It looks more valuable and precious if there's one of each or just a couple of sizes of each. There's space on the racks. Everything else is in the stock room, right? So little things that even a small business owner can do immediately today this afternoon uh, can help deter some of that opportunistic theft. So it's not just about redesigning your entire store and building a, an impregnable vault, right, um, uh, to, to keep your iPhones in. Uh, but, it, but it's about other things as well. Other questions? Yes, Eileen. Not that perception is everything, but it's a lot. I know you're honored to work for DA Bragg, but what do you think the perception is that the whole country has been calling New Yorkers and say, what's going on with that guy Bragg? It's a very bad perception of his reaction to this problem. You said you've been with your um, office a long time, but for the particular office 2014, and this is recently that there's a very, very poor perception of DA Bragg. Yeah. Just I, one other thing. I think for all of you, the people behind the counters in the stores are largely women, and that's, that's a big thing, that women are afraid they're not perceived as having the strength. We may have it, but it's a big problem for women. Thank you so much. That's a, that's a really great point. 
Um, so for, to, your first, to your first point, um, myself and my team receive a lot of those calls, um, and we're out in the community hearing, hearing some of that. Um, and what I put back is I ask for something specific, um, and then I try to address the specific concern that they have. From, from, again, from my experience with the, with the district attorney, he's extremely balanced and very focused on public safety. and. Um, is is working hard to address it. I think that there are some misperceptions um, that that need to be cleared up. And I've I've seen things, I've heard things said that aren't accurate. Uh, if you have sort of a specific concern about something that he has done or not done, I'm I'm happy to to address it and look into it. Um, but in general, he you know, in my opinion, is is doing great work. Uh, he's. Um, very focused on gun violence and, and is doing a lot around that as well. Um, but if, if there's a specific concern about something that he's done or hasn't done, again, I'm, I'm happy to answer that question. And, and, and many, many businesses are part of the, of the Small Business Alliance. And so we are, we are in communication with your office. And that's actually made a, a tremendous difference. And it meant a lot. And there is that notion that we could, we could call. And you could speak to a DA, and you could speak to um, a stealth team. So you really, uh, I think that word is getting out because of outreach that you're doing and you know, making those connections happen with, with small businesses and other you know, larger businesses as well. I think the reputation that people tr have tried to indicate is that he's soft on crime, if that's what you're referring to. Just in general, the perception of yeah, yeah, and and I and I would say from what you're hearing here, I hope that you'll see that that it's not all accurate, and that sometimes things are taken out of context. Um, so. We look forward to staying in touch as well and working together. Um, we're at the end of our time, but before I, let, I, I release my esteemed panel, because I know we could keep you well for a lot longer, let me ask you all two concluding questions, and we can just run down the road quickly. There's a long history of different legal responses to property theft, from hanging to commutation to Australia, to cutting off hands, to, to jail time, to fines, to community service, to uh, a little therapy, right? Uh, let's see why you're doing this and see if we can't make it stop. If you all, if each of you, we're, we're, we're setting in place penalties today. Where would you land on that spectrum? Hopefully not at either extreme end. Um, certainly not the most, uh, most uh, final of solutions. Uh, but also, secondly, um, and, and perhaps more seriously, what's the best creative solution that you have heard of or the best creative strategy that you have heard of or can think of for combating this problem? Two small questions, Matt. I guess I'm first. Okay. Uh, so, well, I mean, I, I would, I would uh, look at the, the uh, effort that would actually stop something like this from happening, and that could that could be from many, many different places. Um, and I think some of it is because of economic reasons. Some of it is obviously because of mental issues that are associated with all this. So, so there are many reasons by which, and many myth directions by which to address the the individual problem and and for those that are not doing it for those reasons and uh, make quick buck uh, you know there's obviously other other ways to do it but uh, you know but the, the reasons for which people get into this are as varied as the solutions by which you could address that and uh, we have to be mindful of all those solutions and what address things so. so everybody keeps their thumb and we look for root, root causes <laughs> Well, I mean, I think that but we, we, we uh, certainly uh, need to address so that it doesn't happen again. And so that the not happening again um, could be addressed in different, in different ways, in different circumstances with different individuals. That, that's really thoughtful. Thank you. Um, I mean, just speaking personally for myself, I'm definitely more on the um, not using law enforcement as a kind of heavy hammer side of things. But that, that's just me. I think for the um, organized um, ring kind of side of it that we've been to some you know talking about in, in some parts, um, which, and which I think is is a big concern for a lot of retailers, uh, you know that that strikes me as really um, a national or even an international level issue um, where you need somebody to who is going after the the money. Um, you know I don't think focusing on the in the store situation is is really the 
the the right focus there. Um, and there are going to be marketplaces, and those are organized groups, and they need to be treated in that manner. Uh, so, yeah. Um, I would guess I would say it's sort of a combination of of, of both, and coming at it from different different um, angles. And one is the you know going after the opportunistic folks that are are doing this and following the money, so the bigger picture. Um, and then to to Matt Matt's point and to what we're doing on the other end from our office is being smart on how we handle um, the lower level crimes and um, being strategic in terms of how we're going to ensure that it doesn't happen again. And it, as it was mentioned before, it looks different for different people. Um, if there's mental health issues behind the reason that somebody is doing very low level um, stealing um, or other, other crimes, I think we need to figure out what's the best strategy to help those folks to stop doing that. And it isn't necessarily prison or jail. So, uh, you know, I think coming at it from those two um, two angles is um, being smart on crime and smart on preventing crime. On that note, I'd like to refer you all to the work of our Fordham colleague, Professor John Pfaff, who's actually written on and argued in favor of abolishing jails entirely. Um, so a very interesting thought. Um, and finally, Professor Valdez. Um, yeah, so I, I think I'd, I'd like to think, and it's not something that I've necessarily looked at, like what the causes are and what the actual stats are of, you know, um, who's perpetrating what, but I do like to think that, you know, obviously I'd love to have empathy where empathy um, should be had, you know, if there's a root cause that maybe is either circumstances or mental health, obviously I would like to take a different approach than, you know, the, the, the hammer of the law. Um, but I also think that some of, the, some of what we're seeing is, is definitely people who have help. It's planned. It's orchestrated. There's there's intent here. It's definitely organized. Um, and I don't necessarily think that you know sending them to a therapist in that case is going to solve the problem. Um, so I do definitely think that there there is some balance, and I do think it's just it's a case by case basis, and it just depends on the circumstances of um, of the theft. And I think in terms of you know like some of the more creative ways, I mean I I think it's just about you know. Do what you can to, to to curb where you can, and I think that that would be the opportunity thefts. Um, and so, you know, I, I we our stores. If you've ever been to a Warby Parker store, are super light, bright, airy. There's not a lot of furniture, lots of walking room. Um, you know, we, we've just taken as many steps as we can to make sure that you know there isn't as much opportunity to to do something or or get away with it um, the way that you would. And then I think you know. A little bit to like the people behind the counter, we, we're training. Um, so I just want to make sure that everybody understands that like it's it's just something that's happening, and we want you to make we want everyone to feel comfortable um, and doing what we can internally to help. We don't have time to ask these guys if they've ever stolen anything, but we do have time to thank them. So let's thank our panels, and we'll reconvene at ten thirty.